the civilizations, and I have the honor and pleasure to welcome today's guests. But before I do, I also would like to apologize for being in this room, as you know, there's a, there's a damage to the other room, and I don't think we can, we are not going to be able to use it until April, I, I was the last thing I heard. So if you are coming to one of the other lectures, so be sure that you know what room to go to. Uh, as you know, this is also a collaboration, a series of, of lectures where we are collaborating with ATTC and it's a collaboration with, uh, between ATTC and the Institute. So we also would like to acknowledge the participation in this series by ATTC. Today I have the pleasure to welcome uh, Shumayan Bandio Padai. Um, he is um, the um, Head of School and Sir James Darling Chair in Architecture at the Liverpool School of Architecture, which is at the University of Liverpool. And he has some, had a number of other prestigious positions, but he is here today to talk mostly about Oman and Money Towns and uh, a couple of aspects that I will mention later. But I think it's important also to, to mention the ARCAM, if I pronounce it correctly, which is an uh, it's an abbreviation for Architecture and Cultural Heritage of India, Arabia, and the Maghreb. And I think that progress pro program, if I may call it a program, is, is very interesting because it relates to a number of developments also at uh, the Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations. We are both collaborating with the Catalan National Library in various aspects. We are both doing this kind of collaboration within the framework of digital humanities. So I think there are kind of connections uh, academically also between the two of us. So uh, what you will do in Archeon is, is, is a kind of research initiative where you bring all extant material of the Persian Arabian Gulf architecture and urbanism under one open access digital platform. And for those who know the Institute's work, this reminds very much of how we are trying to do with the, our collaboration with Catalan's collaboration on the, on the CIRA, where we are bringing all the CIRAs in under one searchable or, or uh, into one digital platform. Having said that, then to point towards today's talk, Kalpomani Town's tradition and the desert and the sea, uh, I think um, it's, for me it's going to be very interesting with uh, what you say, a passionate. Uh, um, can you say this? Uh, I mean, I'm Swedish, I say it anyway, lover of the Omani society and the country of Omani. And so I've been very much looking forward to this talk, and I think it's very interesting also because of the physical layout of the country in order to how they form the different cities. And if, and if you have been visiting Oman recently, there is a lot of work on, on, on how to preserve heritage in the country and what to do with the kind of historical uh, uh, heritage that the country contains. So I think there are many. Uh, and there are many different amounts, the seaside and the interior. There is a definite not a political, but perhaps also then, which I think we might learn today, an architectural tension between the two parts of the Omani society. So I think enough of me, and warmly welcome to Professor Shumayan, and I'm very happy that you are here, and warmly welcome. Um, I think I'll, I'll go without the microphone, if that's okay. Um, can you hear me at the back? Okay. Um, good evening and thank you very much for, I'm really honored to be here and uh, I can see one or two friends as well, <laughs> from long-standing friends. Um, uh, it's a great honor to be here. Um, I have, uh, I've been working on Oman for some time, quite some time, and I've lived in Oman. And again, as you were saying that, I think it's uh, anyone, I feel that anyone who goes to Oman probably develops a strange, um, uh, passionate, loving relationship with Oman, uh, something that is quite difficult to extricate from. And uh, I've felt that same thing. And I think uh, I've, over the many years uh, since my first, I'm a practicing architect and that's how I sort of began my life. And in a, between 85 and 90, I was living in Oman, practicing in local practices and so on. And that's what spawned my interest in, in Oman. Um, and then later on, I sort of continued to do my research, which uh, I think uh, uh, most of my research is on Oman. And I'll, I'll go through uh, a few things uh, today. Um, 
we, and as I'll explain that, and I'll reiterate that a little later, is that alongside the historical research, we also do a lot of work on uh, areas like capacity building, uh, developing uh, master plans and heritage management plans for the government, advising the government on certain uh, how we can make use of historic settlements, and also working with the local communities. Uh, I'll try to explain those uh, through one, one project that uh, we have been doing. So we try to uh, do a range of things uh, within the, this group, the research group, which is RKM. Uh, we have uh, a range of interests and a range of uh, cultural interests and linguistic interests. Um, the research goes from, um, obviously it started off in Oman, but then we have it interest in a lot of interest in a lot of projects in India but also in North Africa as well. So we think that, and more recently, uh, we are working with this, uh, what is called the Gulf Architecture Project, the GAP project with Qatar National Library, which um, is the first attempt to bring everything about architecture uh, on the Gulf, in the Gulf region, under one digital platform within, under one umbrella. And that's a really huge project where we have just begun the first phase of it. It's going to be a exciting project, but it's called quite a challenging one as well. Okay, um, what I was uh, going to talk about today is that the Oman is a particularly, and often Oman has been described like an island, as an island, because you have the sea on one side, and you have the desert on the other side. So the sea and the desert actually confines the kind of habited, inhabited area into a kind of island-like formation. So uh, now that I think is probably also true for most of the Gulf uh, region, where you have the sea and the desert, and depending on where you are, it can be a deep uh, stretch or a very thin stretch. However, I think one of the things that will uh, it distinguishes Oman quite significantly is this um, stretch of mountain, you know, the Oman mountains, which uh, the western part is called the the, the western or Hajar al Garbi but also it is called the Green Mountains, and the eastern part is this, and uh, they actually stretch much beyond, up to Musandam over here, and then at, actually up to near about Ras al Had here. So that spine of mountain range actually gives Oman a distinctive character as well. So Oman is, while Oman is very typical of many of the other Gulf countries, it's also very atypical in many, many ways. And this is what I would like to show because, and many of these, so many of the lessons that we learn from Oman can be also applied and understood in other countries, but there is a uniqueness in Oman that has to be understood always. Um, settlements change, but also uh, across this uh, region, but also uh, what I would like to talk about very briefly, and obviously we can't go into great de uh, detail in any case, um, is the way that some aspects of uh, what I would say the kind of innate uh, life, the desert life, the kind of nomadic life, and how that actually resulted in a settled formation around here, but also a much deeper tradition that underpins all of this, has interacted with, at various points in time, with the, uh, the sea uh, culture, you know, the kind of maritime culture um, uh, that has affected the coast on a regular basis. So these two factors, I think, actually shape up Oman in a big way. And what I will try to show is how uh, these factors have shaped some of the settlements, some influences have come in to those uh, settlements. Uh, and that, I think, will um, kind of show some of the characteristics that I'm trying to bring out. So just on a, in a more detailed level, you know, these are the kind of areas, the central Omani area where most of the settlements are um, located, some of the older settlements, and I'll, I'll go through a number of settlements in this, uh, in the course of this talk. But I'll also focus on this particular hill settlement, Misfat al where we have actually contributed to the making of uh, a sort of implementation of a heritage management plan uh, that I'll talk later. So what we do is that we study history, we study culture, we actually do an interdisciplinary work, we actually work with society, we actually understand, try to understand the social issues. Um, and here, I think the 
the tribal factors are quite significant in, in this case. And we have studied our history, not only just as an architectural history, but uh, in close relationship to understanding culture and underpinning cultures and societal <laughs> relationships. And uh, But also, as we um, are moving towards from the historical study, as we move towards the more contemporary situation where we are contributing by not developing necessarily new towns, we are not doing that, but we are contributing towards the management of heritage sites and how we can actually make those meaningful to younger generations. And so therefore we are considering a number of issues, including economics, the, the present crisis and so on and so forth. Um, uh, so I will talk about that. Just a very brief one is, as uh, was mentioned, the RKM, we have a website which sort of sums up some of the projects we have been doing, and there are a range of things. Some are in India, some uh, many are in the Middle East, and some in Morocco as well, uh, where we have been working on different projects. One publication I would like to cite, which I think is uh, crucial for me, and because it kind of shows the approach that I take uh, in in architectural study of architectural history, and that is. This particular book on Mana, which is a, a settlement in central Oman, where, uh, but by focusing on that one, I was trying to actually understand how um, the different cultural traditions, the very deep rooted cultural traditions, sometimes they, are, they predate Islam, the arrival of Islam, have actually shaped uh, culture, uh, settlement formation, mosques, and so on uh, over a long period of time. And that's something that uh, I'm following up now with another book, which is called Cosmopolitan Muscat which is focusing on the coastal settlements and uh, trying to understand again some of the changes that have taken place now and the reasons for that. Now, we also do a lot of museum work, installations and things like that, where in the National Museum in Oman, where we have done uh, quite a lot of uh, work, including some digital representation. These are exhibitions that we have been doing. The right-hand side one is on uh, in the, in the, at MIT, at the Avicon program. On the left is uh, uh, one on, in Nottingham. So these, uh, the interaction that I was talking about with far-flung countries is something that uh, has happened in Oman for a long, long time. And I think Oman quite significantly actually can boast of a culture which dates back to 3rd millennium BC or even earlier. Uh, in the coast, it is probably around 6 millennium BC when we find some of the, big, the early fishing settlements. In the interior, possibly around 4th to 3rd millennium BC. But we have a lot of these uh, second million MBC, third million MBC beehive tombs. We have also a lot of uh, uh, evidence of relationships with Mesopotamia. Um, and for example, that uh, in the uh, in the text of uh, Isar text, we have the possible um, sighting of a Omani town, which is the Iski uh, uh, over here, Iski. There's the settlement of Iski, which is reputedly in Oman, the oldest settlement in Oman. And uh, it has, it says that the Pade king of Kade, who uh, lives in Iski, sent his envoys and also a lot of gifts to Asurbanipal at that time. And uh, that's probably the first recorded um, evidence. But uh, this uh, has been uh, discussed in great detail. And I think that is kind of more or less secure in that sense. Um, however, we also see a lot of uh, uh, Saudi Arabian connections uh, into Oman. For example, the, uh, in Salala or near around Salala, we have the Saudi Arabian inscriptions. Uh, this is some Huram, which is now called Khorori in Dufar, uh, where uh, this was probably from around 400 BC to around 400 AD. The Saudi Arabian settlements uh, existed and expanded uh, beyond the, its normal sort of Hadramatic. Uh, uh, boundaries and into what is now Oman. So this was a port which uh, traded in uh, frankincense and various other um, uh, goods with the ancient world. And uh, so it's a, again an example of how Saudi Arabian culture at one point had extended. And I would contend that actually it had a much deeper and stronger cultural uh, presence, underlying cultural presence in the Oman region as a whole. Uh, later on, we see, uh, for example, Salud here, which is a, uh, which at least had a period of Sassanid uh, occupation, and which has been excavated by Avanzini and so on with uh, the Italian groups. Um, 
Now, just if I can go to the the topographic, the geographical setting. As I was saying that the Oman Mountains, which is over here with some of the heights reaching about 3,500 meters or so uh, eventually um, are right at, over there in the section. That's the seaside and that's the landward side. So if I'm taking a sort of cross section through this, this is what we'll get. So there are settlements at the coast, then there are settlements just inland Farther up, up in the hills, there are a number of settlements. These are smaller settlements. Then the really older and larger settlements actually uh, take place or uh, occur in this re zone three, I would say, which is over here, and uh, which are uh, which often date back to around uh, 600 BC or so. Uh, uh, certainly, the Falad systems, which I'll show in a moment, actually date back uh, to about 1000 BC in certain cases. And then it peters out into the desert, as you can see here. So if I can just quickly take you through this, uh, these different settlements uh, that I'll try to talk about and take a kind of section through so you understand how these settlements uh, are shaped. So first of all, if you take uh, the coastal one, you know, like um, say Muscat uh, over here, which is primarily uh, a coast which uh, where you know the wadis actually the dry river beds end up so that if you can think about the wadis the water that is sort of coming onto the hills uh, over here are then distributed either over there towards the desert and they disappear into the desert or otherwise they channel themselves uh, towards the sea and these are river beds dry river beds which are quite wide often and during torrential rain, it can uh, flood in within 10, 15 minutes. And it, it is, it is quite, a, quite a serious sort of matter. So those coastal ones have a slightly different quality. They're mainly occupying a lot of these wadi mouths. And uh, also, if you can see here from uh, our aerial photograph from Mirbat in, in Salala, the nature of these settlements are sort of often dispersed, sort of uh, uh, they're not contiguous buildings, they are dis dispersed buildings, uh, creating settlements. Uh, now, of, of course, what is happening here is that much of the portable water actually comes from a sort of slight hinterland zone where there are enough depositions of sewage water, and that is where the water is um, well. And from that water, uh, you know, these settlements survive. Uh, so also the, the day palm plantations, for example, occur around that sort of region. So the settlement, the edge, the strip, the narrow strip of settlement that runs pretty much continuous across the whole of the, the Omani coast uh, is of typically of this nature. So the settlement goes up to the sea, but then the actual uh, uh, plantation occurs just on the belt, on the edge of the settlements where the sweet water is available. Also, what is happening with many of these uh, maritime uh, trading zones, because in a way, what I'm trying to also say that Oman has got this sort of the coastal area, which is much more outward looking, cosmopolitan, and the interior, which is much more inward looking. And this has been the politics right across the last 200 years, and possibly now even that you, you can probably see the underlying sort of uh, trends of that. But what has happened is that, so for example, in Muscat, um, you have, uh, contrary to now the uh, most of the beliefs, that it's not an Arab town. It's actually a Baluchi town, I would say. You know, the majority are Baluchis. Uh, there are also other groups and so on who are from the Indian subcontinental region, uh, and they are uh, settled there for a long, long time. So predominantly Muslim, Sunni, uh, but also there are Hindus and there are also Lawatias. Uh, of course, uh, there are this, uh, well, at one point there was a Smiley sect and then now they are Shiite, um, so uh, 1864 onwards. But the Sun uh, the Baluchis are mainly Sunni and you see sort of very strong indications how some of the Baluchi traditions are coming into it. Unfortunately, this is no longer there, but many of these buildings have been destroyed, these mosques and so on have been destroyed. One other thing that I would like to suggest is that, you know, the minarets, are not a typical part of Omani mosques. Uh, it's a unique thing. And therefore, you know, you can see that even in the architecture that uh, there are sort of very telltale signs of this um, 
you know, wider cosmopolitan uh, maritime trading coming in. So even with uh, the, the mosque that uh, was used for a long time by the ruling family in Muscat to worship, uh, to pray, was um, the Alcor Mosque. Now, if you look into the 19th century images, what you see is a typical Omani mosque. You can see here a little bit of a, this domical um, cupola-like structure, which is called the Buma. Now, the Buma is an integral part of Omani mosque. You don't have a minaret in Omani mosque, in Ibadi mosque. So the main sect in uh, interior Oman is Adi Ibadis. So this is a, the al Busaid uh, prayed in here. And later on, following some of the traditions and the kind of influences that are coming in, we find that minarets are being added. In this particular case, not necessarily as a, a minaret should be, but it's really kind of indicating an entrance through which you go into a mosque. But you can still see the boma over there. So it's a kind of mixture of uh, different traditions coming in as, as we see in, in this particular case. Just before I go into the interior, uh, I would like to say that the main, so in the coast, on the coast, what we have is a series of wells, sweet water wells, which provide the sustenance to both the, uh, the inhabitation, but also the, the date palm plantations. In the interior, the situation is different. A much of these, many of these settlements are actually dependent upon what you call the Falaj system, very similar to the Kanaf system in Iraq, Iran. And uh, some of the oldest ones are uh, attributable to about 1000 uh, BC. So it's pretty ancient tradition. So the debate about whether this was brought over from Iran or not, or whether this was a tradition that had already existed and perhaps refined at some point by the Iranians, that's if they at all had done that, uh, is a debate that's going on. But certainly 1000 BC has been attested. So what you have is the, the, the identification of aquifers uh, because of the porous tone the whatever rainfall comes in, they, that goes into the aquifer. And then what happens is that a mother well is dug first, the first day well to reach the aquifer. And then there is a horizontal channel that is dug across. So this gallery does hewn out of the rock, actually then takes the water out to the settlement area. And that's how, you know, and then a series of these spoil, so these air shafts are brought out like this, where and the spoils are actually in order to prevent the spoils going back in and polluting the water that these sort of embankments are created by the spoil that has come, come out of the, uh, of the cutting uh, as well. So just in a very small way, how the OSS happens, and this is 18th century, uh, as the al Busai tribe, the current ruling families was trying to move from, uh, from the interior to the, to the coast, uh, they created this, if you like, a miniature of an oasis. You know, the you can see this trail of greed here, and that is actually over the the trail of the Falaj. So the line of the Falaj is marked by, on top by this uh, trail of trees, and then it comes first to the settlement. You know, which is uh, which is a fort or a kind of um, it could be called a castle as well, I suppose. Uh, it's an inhabited um, uh, sort of uh, defensive installation where the water is collected for uh, drinking purposes, worshipping and prayers and everything goes on here. And finally, it reaches the agricultural land, which is here. So you have a kind of an oasis in miniature in this one, in Boshir. In fact, Boshir is one of the very ancient settlements that you see. And then later on in the, uh, it obviously uh, for large systems have depended on uh, large scale investment. Money is, uh, uh, so it's about the kind of uh, accumulation of wealth which has actually supported these ones, sorry. Uh, so you find that you have uh, settlements like these in uh, Barkat al Maws, where in the 18th century, 17th century, and possibly into the 16th century, there was much development that took place where these fantastic uh, aquifers and uh, uh, aqueducts, water systems and water channels have been created. Now, in the interior, as you go forward, you have settlements which are sort of on the foothills, as I was describing before. For example, places like Fanja over here, where you have uh, a lot of the settlement under at the base of the hill, 
but also smaller settlements on top of the hill. So in Fungia, you find settlements like this, where you have a hilltop settlement, but the rest of the agricultural land and the settlements are located all around. And this is a typical form for a number of these settlements on the, the coastal side of the hills. If you go farther into the mountains, and this is one I am not elaborating now because I'll come back to it at the end to talk about, is hilltop settlements where there are very small settlements, much smaller, uh, very tight settlements, which are uh, possibly a single tribe settlement in many cases, where uh, settlements have evolved over a long period of time. Um, and those are um, kind of very tightly knit, but it's also on the slope that they utilize the the slope of the, the hills uh, to, to create their uh, date palm cultivation. So I'll come back to that one in a, at a later part, part of it. Then the larger settlements I was talking about, the ancient settlements, the older ones, which are on the inside of the hill, the Oman Mountains, which are at the base, which often have relied on these falas systems a lot more. They have relied on old falas systems. For So for example, so cities like towns like Nizwa, Bahala, Mana, uh, uh, Izki, um, these are dependent upon quite ancient uh, falad systems and water, system, uh, water harnessing systems. And they have been refurbished at different points in time, as I say, uh, that you know, with the accumulation of wealth, in this, especially in the 17th century with the Yarigas, there was a real revival of falad uh, digging and falad restoration. But many of these actually go back to the ancient times of the pre-Islamic times. So you have these settlements like Barkat al and so on, which are entirely reliant on uh, settlements, uh, uh, on uh, Falaj systems. Example uh, is the Bahala, which is a World Heritage Site, which where, where you see the uh, a kind of quite, this is the fort, the main fort, which around which most of the ancient, the core of the settlement has uh, come up. In fact, you can see the mosque here, which actually dates, uh, which with when they restored the mosque, the excavations actually unearthed third million BC burials underneath it. So it's a consistently occupied uh, sacred site, one can say, over a long period of time. And that's been the case with many of these old settlements. The problem is that because these settlements are trying to optimize on land, so arable land has to be given out as much as is possible. And so the settlements are very dense and compact, and they often occur on the edge of these agricultural lands. And therefore, any successive sort of developments over a period of time have occurred with, on the same land. So therefore, we don't find archaeological remains as much as one would think. And that is one of the key problems of these sites uh, in most uh, Omani sites. So this is... Uh, one of those ancient sites, uh, Bahala, which is a world heritage site as well. Now, if I go farther towards the coast, you have settlements which are essentially engulfed by the, the desert. So you've got a whole range of things happening around it, which uh, and a very dense concentration of vegetation with some of the dispersed settlements occurring there and then the desert sort of uh, engulfing it. Um, some examples would be, say, for example, the, the settlement in Sinal, right on the edge. Now, what's happening here is that uh, Oman has always made a distinction often between uh, Bedou and Hadar. So the settled people, Hadar, and the Bedou, the, uh, it's not a clear-cut distinction because there are many groups in between, like the Shawawi groups who are cattle herders of different types. Again, they are not a uniform group, so the idea, the sort of uh, spectrum between nomadism and settled population sort of varies quite quite a lot. So these settlements are actually on the edge of the desert, so therefore they rely heavily on exchange between nomadic people and settled people. So for example, in, in Sanao, there's a huge market which uh, attracts a lot of the, the, uh, the Bedou groups, uh, they actually travel quite significant distances, even from uh, as far as the edge of the desert on the Indian Sea area, Indian Ocean area, where you have places like Dukum, which is now developing into a major port. Those areas, the nomadic groups from there, come up to uh, to Sanaa to sell fish. 
and various other uh, uh, things. They sell also, uh, they also have, it's interesting that they always have a foothold in the settlement as well. So they might own uh, agricultural land, they might own date farm, they might also bury their dead in, in uh, they come back and bury their dead in the settled area. So there are kind of interesting relationships. But all of this is actually underpinned by a tribal structure. So the settlements in all of Oman are essentially tribally organized. That is how the social structure works. And if I can just kind of show you a very quick uh, example of how, say, the al Busaid family, you know, the, the family that em there's a present ruling family, emerges as a small tribe from Adam, uh, just on the edge of the desert. So Sinao is here, Adam is here. These are the kind of exchange points uh, with the, the tribal, the nomadic groups. And these groups then have dispersed across. So the, uh, the al Busaid, I'll show you in a slide very soon, that they started moving towards Muscat, but in that process, they settled in many areas around this region. But these lines are actually the tribal territories. So um, they call Dar, which is a tribal center, and the Dar actually then defines a sort of sphere of influence across a region, a geographical territory, which is what this designates. So for example, many of these areas would be, so uh, I'm not going through all the names of the, those tribes. So in this region, for example, you would have uh, the, uh, a number of, uh, um, say, you know, Ibra groups would be Hinawi groups. Uh, there are a number of other tribes here. Uh, one of the key prob uh, tribes, for example, in Barkat al which I'll talk about, is the Abriin, who are, the Abris are a collection of groups that came together with about 200 years back, and then they formed a new tribe. So it's, they always claim a genealogy, a strong genealogy, but never, that is always constructed as well. So depending on the time, it is reconstructed um, to give it um, a sort of sense of, uh, and we can talk about that later, but the se sense of uh, strength and origin. So in terms of settlements, uh, I've talked about the coastal settlements being dispersed. The, the in, inland settlements are right up on the hills are very tight, small settlements, isolated settlements. And then on the interior, on the inland side of the hill, we have large settlements and large oasis settlements. So if you look at, say, for example, uh, uh, on the hills, what you have is the small settlements having a single tribe. So as I was talking about, Misfat al here, you have a small settlement which is predominantly one single tribe with a Shawawi group, which sits next to it, has a relationship, but the, the, otherwise it's um, the Abriin who are actually dominant here. However, if you look into larger settlements like Sinau, again on the desert edge, you know, you have these settlements, they all belong to different tribes. And sometimes even within one area, you have many others, but these clearly, the ones that I showed you were this and this previously, these are clearly single tribe settlements, but forming this large oasis as a whole. Here, the large oasis, the medium-sized oasis is formed by one single tribe. Okay. However, if you go to the really big ones, like the Bahala, Nizwa, and so on, where you have many tribes coming together. So the, cent the core settlement, they call the Akar, Harat al -Akar, often, is uh, actually made up, as you can see from the color coding, of many groups, many tribes sitting next to each other. And they may not, in otherwise, uh, in other cases, like in settlements like this or this, they might not actually form any political alliance. But in this particular case, they will live, coexist next to each other. So for example, in Mana, where you have these sort of various tribal groups, so about 20 or so of these groups over there, and uh, you can see also how tribal movement begins to shape up some of these settlements. So uh, there are, as I said, about uh, many, many groups. And they, in Oman, what happens is that these tribal groups, um, Arabia was not solely Arab, if you like, you know, for a long time, which we know. But many of these tribes in Oman actually come out of the northern highlands of Yemen. And they disperse uh, following the Marib uh, Dam disaster. Uh, they disperse one along the coast and then comes into central Oman. 
and the other one goes farther north up to a central Arabia, cuts across the desert to Bahrain-ish area, Bahrain, Qatar, then drops down into Oman. So you have these two big flows of people meeting possibly after about 500 years uh, into Oman. And so we have this distinction between what they call Yemen and Nazar. Yemen are the people who are coming along the coast and came into Oman directly. And the Nizaris are the ones that went up north through Central Arabia and back into Oman. So Yemen and Nizar, mainly following the kind of the broad tradition of the Adnani and the Qatani uh, traditions in, in, in the Middle East. Now, if I look into tribal groups and how they change settlements, you know, you can see that this uh, Al Busaidi group, again, I'm sort of following them up here, they came to Manan and they settled here in this agricultural land. So when they settled in the agricultural land, they had to, they also had tribal alliances and other groups coming in. So, so the the group over here that settled, uh, Mandaris, you know, are another tribe who comes from uh, another place called Ibri. They were in alliance with them. And when they settled, they also settled here. Now, if you can see that what happens at that point, and this is about 18th century, where we have a settlement which should have probably been here. There was a fallout system which was based on a spring which came up and watered this part. There were agricultural wells in this area. Now, as they settled down, they had to actually expand the settlement to give something back. So they, you have not only the expansion of the settlement, and you can see the kink of this street here as well as a result of this, but also they actually create a new well at the far end to actually support this one. So tribal movement is also associated very closely with changes in the settlement patterns, uh, their metamorphosis, their uh, morphology is a, quite an interesting one. Uh, and this is always what characterizes many of these Omani settlements. So we can study some of these political and uh, uh, sort of uh, sociological changes. So just to pick up that Al Busaidi one, if I can, from Adam, they're moving to Muscat. So they move, that is Adam, this is the oasis of Adam, right on the edge of the desert. And then they're moving up right through, they do Mana. They do Nizwa, Barqat al Maus, Bahla, and then they go up to Muscat. But in doing that, they also create a stronghold in just in the hinterland in Bosher, that old place that I was talking about, on the in the hinterland of uh, Muscat. And that becomes their kind of major base from where they operate. And if necessary, they can pull back. You know, so they've done it a number of times when there are sort of difficult times that they pull back from Muscat, if you like, into into that uh, the Bosher area here. Yeah. So again, uh, this is Bosher, which I was showing you before, which so the settlement, the actual oasis, the ancient oasis is there. And uh, al Busaid settled here to expand the settlement uh, 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 this way. And they created some really fantastic buildings. There was a lot of interesting uh, politics as well going on. However, I think, so we've talked about this innate uh, sort of uh, tradition of the tr the tribal tradition, and I've also alluded to this idea of the uh, the Mo Omani mosques being a kind of distinctive type. Now, here I will try to show you something else that is happening to the interior uh, from the coast. So, around 1252 AD, we see this first decorated mihrab in Oman. We don't have anything before that. It almost it drops as if in a kind of fine finished form. And this is the mosque in Al in Sal in Nizwa, where we have this beautifully decorated mihrab uh, with uh, a strong set of traditions which probably go back to very ancient, ancient ideas of time and space and so on, with the uh, unending endless knots and so on uh, that are the decorated motifs and medallions of stars. Okay, um, but also you can find that there are sort of very strong Iranian influences sort of uh, coming through. Um, then there is a hiatus of 250 years. We don't hear anything about the Mehrabs at all. And then in 1503, 1503 onwards, we have in Manah a uh, sudden spurt of these uh, Mehrab traditions. So within another 30 years or so, there are about 26, 27 Mehrabs created. And this eventually dies out in 1829, when the last ones we see in, in the 
in the eastern region. Uh, but this is a kind of period where there is a resurgence of Ibadi tradition. The Ibadis are um, a kind of moderate tradition of Islam, which has uh, has always avoided any kind of external expression of wealth or um, of um, you know any cultural expression of that sort. So it's in a way it's a kind of anathema that you know we have a very decorated mihrab in it. The reasons possibly being, and there is not much time, but it's possibly there is a range of um, uh, uh, mystical traditions that penetrate Ibadism at that time. And we can see the influence of that in Zanzibar at a later time when these guys from central Oman are going, the, uh, Emma, the Alamas are going to uh, Zanzibar and setting up themselves up there. And they're talking about some of these mystical traditions. So uh, there is a lot of work that can be done, but nevertheless, it is clear that it's a kind of unusual situation that takes place. However, so that is a tradition that is uh, going on and possibly an Iranian influence coming in here in this case. In the, 15, in the 16th century, in 1503, 1505 onwards, one thing we also see is the introduction of uh, Chinese porcelain into this. And you can see it here. Okay, so this is a kind of tradition of the, the decorated mihrab, as I was talking about, the various decorations. Now, in the Chinese porcelain, uh, the first one is 1503. Now, that 1503 one is an exact match of a shipwreck uh, which has been excavated uh, near uh, the northern end of the Philippines uh, Islands. And that is an exact match of the five, uh, sort of five crescent design, which uh, seems to suggest that, therefore, that that period of production was actually entering Oman at that time. Now, we have done some more uh, chemical analysis of uh, later the shards that we found. And one of the things that happens is that in the early phase, there, is, there are very few uh, pieces of porcelain coming in. So that would suggest that there was a, it was a rare product that was actually of a special value. And therefore, it was put on the, on the mirab as a display of the, the kind of attainments and the resurgence of Vivadism as well. There were issues to do with light, the issues to do with uh, issues of knowledge and enlightenment. You know, those kind of traditions were probably underlying all of this. But what was interesting is that this trickle was coming into central Oman, not only just on the coast of Oman, but well deep into central Oman. And that was being incorporated into an Ibadi tradition, as I said, you know, was actually not uh, wanting to display their their wealth or their, uh, their these kind of the overt material things. So you have this sort of very interesting uh, connection between them. So if I can, at this point, sort of quickly summarize, and then I'll go into Mr. Talabreen, and we can talk about these issues again at a later time. Um, settlements in Oman are shaped by the Oman mountains. The Oman mountains gives it a character. Uh, it is distinctive, therefore, from the rest of the Arabian uh, Gulf area. Uh, you have coastal settlements, which are very dispersed, and they're spread out. They're not necessarily defended settlements. You have then within that sort of small forklets or uh, sewers, they call, you know, within which if there is a uh, at a time of strife, they might actually concentrate their cattle and everything into those. And that is how, and these would be tribal, tribe specific. But generally, the settlement is a dispersed one. Up in the hills, the settlements are very small, but they are also single tribe settlements. Down in the, on the inside, uh, on the desert side of the hills, you have large settlements, defended, but also they are uh, in a way cosmopolitan because they have bring together a lot of tribes from different uh, sort of backgrounds and traditions and they coexist. So within that, this tribal dimension begins to not only shape the, uh, the settlements in central Oman, but also they penetrate deep into uh, to the coastal area. Now, penetrate, uh, go out to the coastal area. Now, the coastal settlements are also strongly shaped by other traditions, like I was hinting at the Baluchi tradition here, but there are the Lawatiya traditions, there are the Hindu traditions. You have even later on, uh, by proxy, a colonial influence coming in at uh, the late 19th, early 20th century, where you have buildings which are shaped by 
uh, some of the colonial uh, things that were happening in India, for example. So you have this sort of maritime tradition coming in. Another uh, thing, an ancient maritime tradition was the Mera, which was, I was saying that in the middle of the 13th century, they came in as deep as central Oman. And in Nizwa, we have one of the first examples of that penetration. Uh, farther on, we have this influence of, again, deep penetration of these, uh, the trading relationships, uh, shaping up the mosques of most of central Oman, where we have these 29 or so decorated Marabs, and those are essentially kind of creation of these uh, kind of Mediterranean, uh, Mediterranean traditions. So I will now go to the other side of things, which is about what we are doing with settlements like these. And I'll talk about this one, uh, Mesota Labrin, uh, in, up in the hills, which we uh, researched and we then uh, developed a master plan. And then we are now uh, building the first phase of that project, which is, a, you know, university sector is quite a unique thing. Um, but we do that because we strongly believe that the knowledge we can bring in, that no other entity, including strong, uh, say, consultants can actually do that because we can bring in that strength of knowledge which others will not have access to. So a settlement like this, um, originally, uh, so it's up in the hills and then dropping down the hill over there. Uh, we have, um, I'll go back to this one. You can see here, the Persians were all over and this one is a, a Persian fortlet, which was right at the top of the hill. Uh, which the remains you can still see here, and it's still towers over the settlement and is a major landmark. And you can see the, the actual wadi starting to come out from the hills, cracking open this uh, fantastic gorge. That's a beautiful setting. And then the settlement uh, is over here, and uh, some of the older parts, some extensions, and so on. So originally, the settlement was accessed from the bottom. Now, and then what happened is, so therefore, it's just outside of this one, there was a donkey track which would come then, so stepped donkey track which would come up to a, lo a location like this, where they would have, and sorry, the location here, which would be the souk of the market, you know, where uh, a periodic market will be held, then that will disappear, and then until the next uh, traders come in. The settlement was developed right at the top end, possibly not in one go, probably a settlement over here to start with, and then at different points, the settlement extended. Clearly the Yariba times, 18th century, that, uh, sorry, 17th century I was talking about, the Yariba uh, uh, developed a lot of resources through their uh, Indian Ocean trade. So East Africa and the wealth that came back created and supported a lot of settlements, and that also supported a lot of palace digging. Uh, in this process. So there was a kind of resurgence of Falaj. So you see a Falaj system which was revived. It was there, but it was revived, So, which will have been an ancient one. And so the original settlement, much more older settlement than this, actually was very close to the source of the Falaj, which was, there are three types of Falaj systems. So one is the aquifer one that I talked to you about, which is the ancient one they call the Dawoodi Falaj. The other one is a uh, any fallage, fallage coming out of a spring, okay? And this is an any fallage, so it comes out of the rock as a spring, and then that water is harnessed. And then the third one is where you have the dry river beds I talked to you about, the wadis. Then when it rains, the wadi fills up, and then there is a channel to take it off the, the water, the main bed, and to then use it for agricultural purposes. As you can see that the, the wadi, systems, the Ghaili Falaj system, is an intermittent one because it, depend, it depends entirely on rain. Whereas the aquifer system is more reliable because the water is there over a long period of time and there are ancient reservoirs so they can tap into that. The spring similarly is there, but the Arabic tradition is that springs periodically disappear and reappear. So there is a problem there as well. For example, Zamzam disappeared for a period of time and then came back again. So those traditions are very strong in Omani culture as well. So initial settlement access was here, the souk was here, settlement up here, and the, the cemeteries were over here. So in the 70s, as Oman started to make a journey towards this, the new, uh, the, the, sort of, uh, the modern era, 
it's created a dirt track which was there till about the mid uh, 1990s uh, which was actually which brought people back here this way so what the settlement which had a f back here because the the cemeteries were at the back the same the settlement had a back here then suddenly flipped around so it became the front and then this became the back so you have this sort of tension between these two areas we know going back to the Yareba times that you know we there was already a settlement as deep as this because Couple of these houses here actually belong to one of the uh, the walis, the governors of Sohar, who was appointed, uh, and a person from this place, but who was appointed by the Yaribas to become a wali or a governor in Sohar, and then he created his large mansion over here. So it was there by the time this set of water channels came up over here. So this ancient settlement which had a back and a front suddenly flipped around so we are actually looking into a slightly different kind of uh, front and back so we studied all of that we studied we developed a sort of detailed plan of everything we studied this ethnography we studied uh, mm -hmm. land functions we looked at how so for example this is about ag agricultural land ownership and how they can tell a story of ancient ownerships and things like uh, how many of the Yariba uh, rulers and later al Busaids as well held land by proxy in many of these settlements. So they wouldn't actually directly hold their land literally by them, but they would be operating through agents. And that happens in many of these places. So you would have names which refer back to some of these past ownerships and so on. And uh, all of this therefore is uh, ethnographic work, historical work, social tribal work, and then understanding the architecture of course. And then, so different houses belong to different sort of uh, factions of this tribe, Fukud. Uh, and so we have these different houses, as I said, this particular one belonged to that, the governor that I was talking about and which developed as kind of quite a collection of houses as we see here. So in doing this one, we, uh, our approach has been that these settlements have to become many, meaningful to future generations. Uh, the way we can do that is by actually going beyond tourism to talk about the real aspects of life, things to do with uh, education, things to do with training, things to do with um, uh, various kinds of modern amenities and facilities that one needs and so on. Now, I'm not talking about all of these things here, but those were the things that underpinned it. Uh, but also the very important thing that even the tourism is one piece out of many that we want to think about. So while the visitors come in, they also actually take a lot back from us, from this oasis, but the oasis gains a lot. At the same time, the locals uh, are an integral part of that relationship. So we're not looking at these as completely isolated or separated relationships, but we are looking into these as integrally connected uh, relationships and that's the way that we can actually develop uh, a sustainable uh, management plan if you like so working with the community was a very important part of this one now what mm -hmm. happened is that uh, quite early on in this, how am I doing for time is that okay for another yeah. 10 minutes yeah. at the most sorry I'll, I'll finish okay um, so there was a guy Ahmed, who Ahmed Al Abri, who did archaeology, uh, but he he belonged to this place, and then he used to bring uh, initially some of his friends when he was studying at the Sultan Qaboos University, and he came back with his friends. They stayed there over the weekend, and they, he found that that was quite an interesting thing. So he uh, then eventually, when his father died, he sort of acquired the properties and started gradually turning those into um, sort of short stay accommodation, okay. and this. But at the same time, he was also very keen to develop a, a community-based approach to it. And he was struggling with that one, because one problem is that Oman, like many other Gulf countries, sort of recognizes companies, but doesn't recognize uh, cooperatives. So there was no way that we can actually have developed a cooperative system, you know, whereby everyone can come together. And also there was this sort of threat of tourism, because everyone was opposed to tourism. So 
The people that who lived there around that time, say about 150 or 200 people, and the rest had moved to new houses, but still had a stake here. Uh, they were all opposed to it. So gradually, what the and also the community was at loggerheads with the ministry, Ministry of Heritage, uh, Ministry of Heritage and Culture, Ministry of Tourism, two key players. So our role, as we came in, and we were warned about that, that our role was to create that bridge. If the bridge worked. It will work. If it's not, it wouldn't work. So, and it has been. Uh, there's been a case in the night, late 1990s when there was an effort made, but it didn't actually work because we could not make this happen. So it was a complex process over five or six years of actually building that relationship with the community, and also working very closely with them in order to get their uh, consent on things that we were developing, but also developing the structure of a cooperative so we worked very closely with them we then made the representations to the local government and so on to develop the cooperative structure and so that it can become gradually accepted and incorporated into it so and also the dissenters to this whole process uh, which were say about you know only five were there when Ahmed started and the rest of the 150 were opposed to him uh, now we have probably the other end of it where three or four opposed to it, whereas probably about a hundred plus are really behind it. And so over the last two years or so, which is good and bad, is that um, notwithstanding the master plan we have done, people have gone on and developed their properties in a particular way, which is good because they have taken that initiative now, but also bad because it actually does not uh, adhere to the, 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 the morphological structure that we wanted to keep of the settlements as well. So there is this problem that we are facing, but we developed this, um, the cooperative structure and also given the particular political structures of the country uh, and uh, for other Gulf countries, because we are hoping that this can actually become a model for other countries as well, that how do we actually integrate that back into the ministerial structures that they understand it. So as I was saying that community developments, training and so on, we have been doing a number of workshops. Sometimes we are presenting the work. Uh, you know, here we are presenting the work about how we understood the relationship. In other cases, we have actually done, I'll just go forward to one image here. Uh, no, sorry, I think uh, I'll, I'll come back to that later. So we are developing these various things and we have, I'll show you a little later that we have done also a number of workshops with the local community, children, women and so on to develop that uh, understanding a bit better. So one key problem was to do with tourism, uh, was to do with uh, traffic. You know, if you go on an Eid uh, uh, holiday time, it is absolutely chock a block. Local people can't actually park their cars. It's a hell of a problem. So one thing that they wanted is to actually address this. So we did a traffic management plan and to also therefore bolster the the economy of the, the livelihood and the kind of support of the, the cooperative that we are trying to create. So they can we can park down at a lower level of the hills and then we can actually then take them. The co-op can actually ferry them up to the settlement. So therefore, there is very little um, of a impact on the settlement. We also looked at all the study of the, the historical work, the social work and the ethnographic work actually fed into some of the understandings of the sites that we worked on. So therefore, the master plan that was developed, uh, which included sort of, you know, car parks to streets and passages and everything else, and the various parts of the buildings, uh, the, the, uh, the settlement, the various parts of the settlement, we developed that on the basis of some of the understandings that we had uh, already achieved there. Now, in the master planning, we then created areas which will then avoid any kind of uh, the issue of privacy will be uh, retained, maintained. And so we can, without signage, we can actually work the settlement in terms of tourism, in terms of uh, the developing the traditional practices and so on further. We also looked into uh, sustainable energy generation. We found out the ways in which we can, and we costed these things out so that we can introduce uh, the various kind of sustainable practices that can uh, help take this place off grid, if you like, you know, in a, in a carefully calculated way. So then the master plan, this is the traffic management and the so things that we were doing on with that one. Uh, one thing that happened at that time, the oil prices went down. The government then said, we can't actually help you in any way. 
this has to be done. Uh, while we have built up this bridge with the local community, and then suddenly we came to a point where the government said, well, we can't do anything. You find out a way. So we were immediately asked to so find out, and we, we thought that, well, who are the people who are going to give us any help in this? So we identified a whole list of groups, uh, even within the government sector, where there were provisions for, say, SMEs to be supported, uh, for provision for, say, in the context of a heritage structure, where support can be achieved, uh, gained from the Ministry of Heritage and Culture. So we tried all those options and brought that again back to the ministry. But also that opened up an opportunity for talking to uh, other non-government bodies. So this is the first time. Previously, everything in Oman, everything pretty much in the whole of the Gulf area is controlled by the government. So therefore, when I started work in Manan, we, uh, I was asked to actually come in and do that. They said, no, 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 we'll buy, buy all the properties. So therefore, immediately disenfranchising the group, the local inhabitants in a big way. So in this case, because of this particular uh, event that happened, we managed to go get for the first time a public-private partnership working in this particular case, which is quite an achievement in that sense. So the master plan again, also fortuitous things happened. Uh, the, the Prince of Wales was there and we took him around, we showed him the place and he was very interested. There was also one of the Kuwaiti prince who was very keen on um, sort of uh, extreme adventure. Uh, so he came around as well. So those things did work. And then the Bank of Muscat, one of the banks in Muscat, they said that they will be very keen to help us with through their corporate social responsibility. That's how we, uh, and then we worked together with them to establish a phase one because there's only so much money we can do. So what is the phase one? So we start, started by looking at the phase one. So this is a workshop we did with local children and local uh, women, uh, children, men, everyone, uh, bringing the ministry together. But we, as we develop the master plan, you know, over there, this master plan in a lot more detail as well, but we also wanted to actually get their input into it. So in developing this phase one, what we said that you tell us what you'd like to have. These are the areas we think we should be developing. Tell us a little more about it. So we did a lot of these sort of work with kids uh, to developing some of the ideas. Some of these ideas are what we have incorporated. So this is the phase one, where as we said, parking is very important for them, yes. Then the gateway is falling apart. Then there is a street which is has over hundreds of years of walking up and down, has actually come to a kind of almost a sort of polished state of basal, and that is really dangerous, so we had to do something with that. But also we uh, looked at this area where we thought a training in local culinary uh, skills would be really good, so we developed, which used, used to be a sort of tenor, uh, uh, it's called the Harata Shua, where you make the meat during the Eid, festivals, but also there was a bread making place. So we wanted to revive that. There was also an area where we can, we thought that it would be great to have some kind of food court, which would be run by the locals. So we, we did that in this phase one. So these are some drawings, which I'll quickly run through. The gateway was falling apart and we wanted, we had to do something about this. So the main gateway, which is coming up from the car park, where we obviously uh, conserved that. But also the next building, which was abutting against the rocks, we wanted to convert that into some kind of information. So anyone who comes there also understands that. And this is the situation currently of that place. And so we developed some kind of a uh, um, uh, sort of information place, but all run by the local community. And this is the Haratha Shua, which is where you know the Tanur is actually currently occurring. You can see the during the Eid, what happens there. It's a very tight space. So we wanted to retain that. We wanted to retain the quality of that, but also develop the space here and the buildings over there. So this is where we, this is the bread making place. There was something here. So this is the state of it. And we are beginning to make that. So currently work is on site, uh, be beginning to uh, separate the material, the material that is valuable and can be retained, material that can be then taken away, uh, debris that can be taken away as well. So these are various buildings which implies predominantly ma traditional materials, but also introduces one or two uh, new uh, 
artificial <laughs> interventions as well, should I say, because I think it is very important and I strongly believe that the world is, it has to represent the world that we are in. And I think the world is not about just an ancient tradition, which is also about today. You know, we are both, uh, we are straddling these worlds. And I think the architecture has to represent that straddling of those two different worlds or many worlds. And this is where I think we strongly believe that adaptive reuse, where we can carefully manage the interventions which are uh, of a contemporary nature, but keeping with the spirit of that place has to be introduced. So these are some of those things where we ended up looking at uh, traditional materials, but also very carefully introducing modern materials in the sense of like, how do you pigment a material, you know, because otherwise you can't actually work with, uh, uh, say, if you're using um, a particular kind of um, uh, mixture composite of, say, clay and, uh, say, uh, cement, how do you actually make that work? So those kind of things were used here. Um, so really running through some of those things to come to an end. So just to sum up, I've talked about the diversity of settlements. I've talked about the cultural, the social complexity and the cultural complexity of that place. And I think it's very important also to understand that these places, in order to intervene in these places, we have to uh, work with the knowledge of uh, a developed knowledge of this area. And many of the interventions and previous work and a lot of the work that is going on as well now actually does not do that. And this is what we are trying to amend through this work. We worked with the community, which was, I think is a very important part of it, their aspirations, their directions, and we have to actually shape up the settlements which attune itself to both the contemporary needs, but also the traditional, the, the qualities and spirit. Thank you very much. Okay, so now the floor is open for comments, questions. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Um, I don't have any particular background in architecture. I've just, I happened to visit Oman just by chance for about a month, just in January. And uh, what I was struck by was that uh, this, as you talk about this traveling between the, with, with the modern world and the ancient kind of tradition, but in relation to that, what we were talking about earlier was the, the tribal system. And what I was struck by was that uh, time and time again, people told me that when uh, an Omani person reaches the age of 23, they're given a plot of land in their hometown, which really ties them down back to their old home place, which is creating a major pr problem in mobility. Mm -hmm. People are very unwilling to give up their job. Mm -hmm to move somewhere else because they've got this tie back down. Do you, does that affect any of the projects that you work on? Uh, what, I think this, uh, the mobility issue has kind of, the, the initial thrust because all the focus went towards Muscat. So obviously um, from 1970 onwards to about when I first arrived in Oman in 1985, I think the majority of uh, the population had either moved to Muscat or is, and hence you see this long stretched out uh, sort of uh, beats of uh, settlements. Um, but also uh, they have either moved completely out there or that they actually have a, a foothold in their old community. And this is still the case that many of this, and you have this mad rush in the, over the weekend, it's just about 2.30, the, the yes. university is closed, yes. but by 2 o'clock, I think everyone is out on the main high roads to, to go back to their towns. And now, I think Omanis have a very strong uh, connection with their, their original place. And I think that has been the case, and that has not been um, significantly altered, I would say, uh, with the pull of musket. Now, thereafter, what the government tried to do is to create these regional centers. So, for example, Nizwa becoming a regional center, Sohar on the coast, um, various others, you know, Salala, of course. Now, it has taken time to develop that, but I think that is, that is where the government is trying to go. Uh, it has got its problems. It's not so easy because it's also disrupting some of the traditional hierarchies. You know, so, for example, in the interior area, Nizwa, Mana, Bahala, 
uh, Iski had a similar kind of weight. Now, in putting Nizwa as the central thing, these other ones are peripheralized and they're kind of downgraded to a kind of, uh, if you like, a sub wilayat level situation. That immediately creates a developmental issue. Uh, of course, there are then Sultan's, um, uh, the new palace, the East Fort, and the new museum is coming up next to Mana. So that gives a different dynamics to it. But what I'm trying to say is that there are, we need to understand those dynamics quite very carefully, which has not happened in order to understand the kind of current trends of mobility. <laughs> However, the dominant trend still remains that, you know, Omanis do go back to their, uh, their, their core. Uh, however, I think the, the problem is that in all of this, and coming back to the architecture side of it, that we have never seen uh, architecture that is um, respectful to the past, at the same time aspirational of its future. This is a problem, and we're trying to, and you see that in civic buildings, you see that in, you know, uh, in uh, because at the end of the day, architecture is about space. It's not about the overt expressions of, uh, you know, how, you know, whether you to put to Islamic looking artists, I mean, who knows what, what that is. But, uh, you know, the fact that the, the focus has moved away from space and understanding of space, which is developed by society, by these tribal relationships and so on, which is still held very strongly in, in Oman. And you see that in in sort of everyday buildings of every people who, when they're not taking architectural help, then they're doing, they're actually unconsciously evoking spatial orders, which are of that continuity, which doesn't happen in other cases. So we are to blame as consultants and architects and so on, because we are not educated enough, I would say. And this is where I'm going back to that knowledge issue that I was talking about. We have you, you, and then you. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I have two questions, if I may ask. Uh, first is about uh, the morphological uh, character uh, characteristics. You said that I'm a, not an architect. I'm on. That's fine. But it's I, good to have non-architects. Yeah. So uh, you said that uh, while you were working on, a, on that specific project and different projects, you, your team and you try to to preserve the morphological Omani specific uh, Oman specific morphological attribute or characteris characteristics. Mm -hmm. So what were exactly those? Uh, like you talked about pigmentation, the color of pigmentation yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. of soil and uh, things yeah. like this. So what was that? Uh, no, that that is not. I think the. As I was going back to the idea that, you know, I think it is about, I'm interested in space and how people use space. So even two similar looking settlements like Mana and Nizwa, I'm talking about, you know, they have a significant differences in the way that the houses are organized. So the typology of the houses. So for example, in Mana, there are no courtyards. Now, we always talk about Islamic houses being courtyard centered. It's not the case at all in that. that. Whereas if you go to the coast, yes, you have a lot of copium, but in a different way. Uh, in Mana, they're like literally like terrace houses, you know, as we see in the in the West. You know, they're tight, dense, packed things, which goes longitudinally deep, and therefore they have uh, a front and a back, where the back does not often have any courtiers. Yeah, so there are some what they call shamsias, the sort of light wells into those spaces, but they are deep spaces which are used for different purposes in that. Now, if you go to Nizwa, that is slightly different. Okay, if you go to Bahala, that's very different. Now, even within those 20 kilometers or so, the typology of these, uh, the type of these houses differ. And if we don't understand, and we think that, well, this is the same as this one and the other one, then I think we'll make a big mistake, okay? The other thing is that every settlement depending on the cultural political things and i was describing in mana that how the albusaids came in and then they changed some of the part of the settlement because they brought in also with them the alliance of another group which is integral to any tribal group that as soon as one becomes dominant then there are allied groups then there are also which we do not often understand are social stratifications where uh, we have groups which are not as actually part of the arab genealogical structure and they exist as well 
So, you know, while Islam doesn't believe in uh, social stratification, it does occur. Okay, not economic stratification, social stratification, it occurs. So you have this multiple sort of kind of complexities of these things. That is where space comes in, because in certain, in the way that certain areas are allocated to certain groups, certain mosques or certain sublers, uh, male meeting areas are allocated to certain groups and their subsidiary groups makes a space. And that we can pick up in one case, which would be quite different to another. You see, this is a morphology. This is a structure of space that we want to keep. And this is where, and so in the case of like Ms. the Labrain, where it's a single tribe thing, the sabla was not part of the settlement because it didn't matter. You know, they were all the same. So therefore it could actually be out there, right? And that facilitated the soup coming in here. So there is this sort of, uh, you know, overlay of another spatial type. Whereas in the case of Mana or in the case of Bala, you know, because they're tribe specific, you know, my group, my area, my neighborhood is mine. Therefore my well has to be mine. Nobody else will come into that one. My mosque has to be mine. My sabla has to be mine. That is very different. And so if we are intervening in a big settlement like that, we'll have to approach it even different. So that's what I mean by morphological story. Thanks, Suman, for your very interesting presentation. Fascinating. Um, in political economy, there's a notion of the volunteer state, I, as you talked about oil and so on, that the oil, was, oil, oil, oil uh, supplies gives the opportunity for the state, the government, to effectively not consult citizens and so on. Um, and I was struck by, you know, your, your talking about how the government initially they said, oh, we'll buy all these and so on. Um, now, um, it seems to me that, but then they had to pull back with the oil price going yeah. down. The, what you sketched out was actually bodes very well. I mean, obviously, Oman hasn't got the oil reserves and gas yeah. reserves over on. Do you give us, my question is, do you get a sense that the government would like, if it were able, say the oil price increased like that, to almost to take back that control, what they're used to, their kind of modus operandi, or are they quite happy? I mean, you've kind of almost developed this kind of community uh, way of being. Yeah. Um, and conversely also, are people, the people you're working with finding, oh, actually, this is quite a good way of working. And actually, we are using our initiative. And this is something which in the classic sort of political economy launches state. The idea is that almost the state becomes a distributive state and it almost deprives people, it begins, people lose their initiative. Mm -hmm. So really, that's my question is, would the government take that? Back, go back to all ways that they could. Would they? Would they be not resisted against by these people? Have people got used to these more cooperative ways, and could that evolve in any other way? I think um, <clears throat> it's a very interesting question and a very important one because what has happened since the downturn in oil prices <clears throat> is that the government has been forced to reevaluate its uh, position and the way it operates and the way it also relates to um, the population. Um, with that, there is also a gradual move towards a kind of democracy, if you like, because the Majlis Shura, you know, the Consultative Council has been set up. Now there are elections, uh, albeit one could say that it's very tribally you know, organized because um, if I belong to a tribe, I will probably quite likely that I would vote for a person who is still from my tribal community and not the other one, even though that person may be a better uh, you know, or a more uh, capable person for that role. Those things happen, but nevertheless, there is a move towards uh, democracy of some sort. And I think that is a very considered one, given the particular tribal situation that Oman deals with and the wider gulf you know very well, um, that I think it is that gradual move towards democracy has been good. So there is one thing that is happening. I think uh, the government has also realized that this has opened up this, as you rightly point out, the, the entrepreneurship of the entrepreneurial character of the, the people. And the fact that they're taking leads, but also the fact that uh, we could actually then enter into a relationship with other parties, non-governmental parties. So there is now an initiative called Tanfid, which is trying to bring together governmental and non-governmental bodies or semi-governmental bodies into under one umbrella so in order to actually begin to deal with bigger issues so like natural gas or like you know the issues of heritage they are gradually becoming uh, addressed through this sort of larger cooperation 
And I think that is that is moving in the right direction. And for example, my one of my PhD students who's uh, from the Ministry of Tourism is actually Saeed is working on how greater uh, autonomy can be given to the local communities and what are the methods and measures we can do given the prevailing cultural and political situation. So I think it is moving in the right direction, I would say. Really, really interesting to hear you, and especially your very sensitive approach. I just wonder, to what extent do you have, are you able to rely on local talent to help you in your project? Yeah. And to what extent do you end up having to uh, rely on foreign input? Yes, I think that is a, a big issue, and it's a very important thing. I'm glad you raised it, because one of the things from the very early stage, when, um, and this is... Uh, you know, going back to about 2009 onwards, you know, when um, prior to that I was working on my own and I was trying to bang on their door saying, well, we need to do something, we need to do something with these places. And it's about now 2009 onwards, things began to change a bit. And the first thing we did is that in our all our agreements with the Ministry of Heritage and Culture, we put in our need that we would like to train and work with local uh, students. And so, and that also happened with the, with the Muscat municipality as well. So this cosmopolitan Muscat, that book I was talking about, is actually, uh, we, we interviewed and we got uh, 12, um, uh, they're not architects, they're not all, one or two of them are from architectural background, but they came from different backgrounds. They were recent graduates of, not the Sultan Qaboos University, but from local politics. And we interviewed them. There were six girls and six boys we recruited. And they did, we trained them up to do, how do you do the documentation in a site like this? How do you actually take photographs even in the right and sequential way? So all the kind of methods that we were trying to uh, bring in. And so we prepared guidelines and everything and we handed that over, but we were sort of interacting with them on a regular basis. So they produced all the work over there. In the case of the Ministry of Heritage and Culture, we constantly, we brought, in each case, we had uh, ministerial uh, members, not from higher level, from sort of at the, at the end where they are in the sort of, on the sort of, they are the facing people, you know, facing the community, yet they are not equipped. They don't have the knowledge, they don't have, even with their own culture, they're not uh, aware. Of that and that is something that we wanted to build up so we were training or working with them in local communities so we were gaining as well a lot because they could then suddenly say hey i didn't realize that this is what was happening in my place so you know each case we uh, worked very closely and trained a number of ministerial people as well as students um, to develop a group of people who can, <coughs> are now then taking on other roles as well in different places so that has been a very strong one. Uh, in the case of Minister of Tourism, they were not greatly helpful at that stage. They were otherwise very proactive, but they couldn't give us any people to work with. But in the case of Minister of Heritage, we worked all along. And this particular Muscat Municipality one was a very good example. And then coming back to the Minister of the Labrain, here, the tourism people were some really important. So that was a great coming back, if you like. Yeah. Yes, sorry, are the citizens still sort of underwritten by the by the by, by the ruling family. They no. Every year, they? no, no, uh, well, not quite. No, I think they they in most the Oman. I think the majority are obviously still uh, working in the government sector, mm -hmm. but the secondary tertiary sectors are growing quite quickly. Uh, there is also a very quickly growing, <coughs> fast growing. Um, Omani professional community, which is uh, becoming more and more interested in different things. So I think it is, no, it's it's much more diverse, if you like, you know, in, in that sense, to the point that, you know, some Omanis in these local communities are just barely getting, you know, through their lives because they have so little. You know, to, but also people don't understand and they don't have the wherewithal to deal with, uh, say, agricultural produce, you know, you're producing bananas, right? They are, it's almost taboo to sell it because it's not the right thing to do. So therefore, the culture is in a way, so I use, I consume it, whatever I consume at home, and then the rest is thrown away. 
or the huge Bangladeshi laboring community who are producing fantastic agricultural produce, almost a parallel culture, you know, yet it is not being recognized because some of those things, either there is this issue about attitude about expatriate labor community, or it's about, oh, I don't eat that vegetable. You know, so, and in Salala, you'd find that in the afternoon, there is this huge uh, market that comes up, you know, which is uh, run by the expatriate communities. It sort of unfolds and then kind of goes back again. And everyone comes to that. So what I'm trying to say is that these many sectors are sort of sitting next to each other. And that's really a huge amount of work that has to be done on the modern uh, economy. And that because there is no one almost root of income. There is one formal root of income perhaps. But every Baluchi has a taxi, you know, that they're operating. So after two o'clock, they're out there. But we don't study that very well. And unless we understand that, you know, how it's happening. We will not be able to sort of contribute to this. Great work. Great work. Thank you. Yes, it's very important. Cool. Sorry. Hi, um, I have some two questions, but they're quite brief. My first one refers to your initial answer to the other gentleman's question about how you have a PhD student who is doing um, some work and he's looking at how groups of Omanis are trying to look for greater autonomy. Are they looking for greater autonomy within like the heritage sector and with like autonomy over their own heritage, or is it in other fields? And then my other questions on the other side. Initially, at the beginning of your presentation, you talked about the mosques that had the Balochi style um, influence and tradition, but then you said that they don't exist anymore. Is there a reason why they don't exist anymore? Um, the first thing is um, that I think the the desire to have to take control of people's their lives, I think, is happening in many sectors. So it's not just about uh, heritage. In fact, heritage is slightly disadvantaged in the sense that there isn't the, the technical knowledge or the wherewithal that you know, would support uh, heritage. Because it's not only just about you have to understand <coughs> one's own culture, there's you know, the, um, the university education or the college education, or the school education is very well standard, it's sort of stru you know, structured in a way that doesn't allow you to think about these things and how can I deal with this situation. Um, so there are sort of massive gaps in uh, expertise among, amongst the, the Romanis. And that is, I think, a big problem in the heritage sector. And also there is still the attitude of many ministries that, well, you know, we tell you what to do. You know? And that is that is uh, always a problem, and especially the Ministry of Heritage is not the most proactive people, shall we say. And the other thing is that the ministries don't talk to each other. So therefore, a training developed in one is not then taken up by another ministry. Or that a development of a master plan in one, supported by one ministry, is never then pushed into uh, the other ministry. So the ministry almost okay. starts, starts from scratch to do that. Yeah. And that, I think, is, is a problem. So therefore, that the fact is that you know while there is a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of entrepreneurship, uh, they are happening in all kinds of sectors, tourism, uh, also uh, IT related sectors, um, you know, art, there was a lot of work happening there, uh, heritage as well, but I think it's a bit ill-educated if you like, you know, within saying within quotes, uh, but that is that is a problem. About the other one is, um, it's a drive towards um, what's one's heritage is, is a problem. Uh, I think what is understood as state heritage is another uh, an issue. Aside from that, there are developmental pressures, genuine developmental pressures, which have actually seen the demise of a lot of uh, heritage in many cases. Oman, thankfully, is still retains a lot, but if you go to Qatar or Bahrain and so on, it's, there's not, nothing almost. So in the case of the Baluchi Mosque that I showed you, uh, I think we could have retained that, you know, but I don't think that there was that knowledge that this was a unique thing. You know, that is almost, you know, it can be, there are so many of these influences one can read into that one little tower, you know. But we lost that because they, the local community didn't even know what they're looking at and what they had. And therefore we lost that and we have lost many of those things. But also that, uh, as I say, that I think it is that growing understanding of what constitutes national heritage. And it's not only one national heritage or one group's heritage, but it's these multiplicities. That's gradually growing, but sometimes it's a bit too late. Unfortunately.
Thank you. Okay, so that would be the last one. Okay. Um, I was interested in looking into the settlements that you have showed, uh, the desert of inland. And I was wondering, like, um, these clustered housing, um, were these, you know, something that emerged from the traditional Omani wedding? And how uh, has these prototypes that evolved over time? And are there any efforts being done in preserving these clusters of housing? And like how they have evolved in terms of materiality or spatial settings? Mm -hmm. Because what you showed, I'm not sure whether they were traditional Omani houses. They're all traditional. Yeah, yes. and you know, like how they have changed over time. Yes, I, I think we are doing some of the studies of this is the morphological studies of how yeah. something started off perhaps and how it evolved, both at a level of a dwelling, but also at the level of settlements, you know, because uh, and correlating that with um, probably tribal movements, social developments, mm -hmm. political changes, uh, growth in um, sort of certain uh, wealth accumulation, you know, uh, distribution of wealth, you know, those kind of things have happened and over time those things have impacted on settlements. Uh, in the case of the dwelling, as I was saying before, that in all of these cases, uh, mana has been kind of restored by the Ministry of Heritage, and now it has been handed over. And again, kind of Francis, you know, another thing is that they are now, uh, for the first time, mana has been given out to a private operator. So having taken it out away from the local community, now it, there is an attempt to give it back to local operators. Now we are working with one of those local operators in mana. This is the first one in, in the one's case where a local operator, and thankfully this person also has a PhD and a PhD in heritage, so therefore he understands this, and a team. So uh, the, these settlements are hopefully in the preservation work that has happened and the work that we are doing and various others are doing, hopefully we'll be able to preserve some of these spatial characteristics. And that is my key aim is not to just preserve a visual appearance because that is that is the defeat of heritage. Because heritage, at the end of the day, it only exists because we exist in space, you know, and that means you know that you know that has a wall and therefore that is separating me from the outside. Yet I can see it, therefore it has a particular character. It has to be a particular material. That's how architecture is. Okay. So same thing happens over there, and that you know settlements, uh, houses have developed in different ways. For example, in Central Oman. A lot of the houses have got the lower level is given to cattle, you know, so you have cattle and storage and everything. Cooking always happens upstairs. Toilets are upstairs, you know, so you have a pit latrine, you know, and those are different from, say, even uh, Mesothelebrine, which is still interior, but it's up in the hills, but it operates in a different way, and then certainly different from the coast. Now, these types are very, we're obviously doing the studies, but at the same time, in these interventions we are focusing on and hopefully this is a message we are trying to push as well to the ministries is that we have to retain and conserve these spatial entities and that's what we're trying to do. Okay before we thank uh, Professor Sumyan I would like to say that uh, there are more lectures in this lecture series together with AKTC. If you need more information about them talk to Nayal over there. Can you just raise your hand? Mm -hmm. And there will be a continuation in the fall with a little bit different perspective with also bringing the other communes in, in Toronto in the picture. So I think there will be a kind of continuation where we focus on creativity more broadly, bringing in music and other kind of art, what do you say, examples of art. So once again, warmly thank you and uh, to listen to you more again, perhaps in the fall. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.